Well, it's dawn here at the teaching company. The cows have been milked. Things are going terrifically. Over last night, the sound technician switched me from New York accent to the, the lovely, lilting Scottish brogue you're hearing now. And thus, we are ready to plow into the next subject. The next subject being the second half of last lecture. What the last lecture did was introduce us to the piece of history, the loves of Hans Selye, the hatreds of Hans Selye, the great triumph Trojan Greek battle between Selye and the psychologist, and the emergence of the recognition of how important psychological factors are in modulating the stress response. That transitioned us to the absolutely critical question, what is it about psychological stress that is stressful? And we covered the first three of some of the key variables, the role of outlets for frustration, the role of social support, the role of predictability, and what we do now is continue in some, some more of those key factors. The next one is a biggie, which is a sense of control general rule, and we will see soon how impossibly simplistic that general rule is, but the general rule is the more of a sense of control, the less stressful a stressor is. Now, you can show this pretty cleanly with a lab rat, the same sort of experiments as in the last lecture. In this case, though, a rat who will be getting shocks now and then has been trained, has been trained to press a lever. And by pressing the lever, it decreases the likelihood of getting a shock. So here's what's happening. Scenario number one, you've trained that rat to be able to do that, and the rat gets put back into the room where it gets the shocks, except you've taken away the lever. The lever isn't there, and the rat has a massive stress response, far more so than it would have gotten had it not gotten that lever training. And it's obvious what it's doing. It's sitting there saying, give me the damn lever. I know exactly what to do to get this under control. And it has lost the opportunity to do that. Or you could see the flip side of it. Now you've got the rat who's been trained to press the lever and back there in the room and getting the shocks and the levers there. But today you've disconnected the lever. It's doing nothing. It's placebo. Pressing it doesn't at all decrease the likelihood of a shock. But the rat's in there pounding away on the lever saying, this is great. Just imagine how many shocks I'd be getting. Otherwise, it thinks it has a sense of control. And what we see here is the power of control to modulate the stress response. A very, very potentially powerful one. Okay, so what else can you say about control? What else can you do in terms of making sense of it? You begin to transition to what does this look like in humans? And remarkably, it looks exactly the same. A study done by Owen Walkowitz at UCSF, and what he did was essentially translate the rat study into humans. Volunteers sitting in a room, and every now and then, unpredictably, there would be a blast of high decibel noise, very unpleasant, up goes blood pressure. Now, instead, the volunteer is sitting there, and they've been told, by pressing this little button here, you decrease the likelihood of the blast of noise happening, and you don't get as much of a rise in blood pressure, emit the exact same number of the shocks, same deal as in the rats, same exact model. And you can see this playing out as well in all sorts of human occupations, a realm of occupational psychology, stress management, and an awful lot of what it's about is the amount of control you have in your workplace. Now, to begin to make sense of this, we have to start with one of the great myths of stress physiology, and this is the myth of the executive stress syndrome. And this emerged in the 1950s, a study that ostensibly showed that having a high degree of control of responsibility ulcerated you like crazy. This was a study where there would be two monkeys that would get shocks now and then, and one of them had the power by pressing a lever over and over and over to decrease the likelihood of both of them getting shocks. And what they showed was this executive monkey with his hands at the wheel of the ship and captain of his own fate and this other one's fate would have more stress-related diseases. Ah, executive stress. 
And this permeated through everybody's consciousness, especially sort of the bloated robber barrets who say, oh my God, now it turns out that yacht is not such a great thing because I am under so much stress. What a victim I am. It turned out there was an extremely flawed piece of that study and that the researchers, for typical reasons, wanted to get a good result and wanted to get it quickly. So what they said was, hey, why don't we pick out the monkeys who seem to be the most uh, hyper-emotional and reactive, and we'll make them the executive monkeys. And no wonder they got the stress-related disease. They had blown the design. They didn't randomize the subjects. So that trashes the notion of the executive stress syndrome. Who do you actually see getting stress-related diseases in the large corporate world? It's not upper management. It's middle management. It's middle management because of the key feature about life in the middle there, which is you have high demand and low control. High demand in that you've got to do all sorts of difficult things. You're in a position of great responsibility. Low control because you're not the one making up the policy. You're getting the orders from on up high. It's middle management that has the most problems with stress-related disease. And when you look at individuals, it's the ones who most interpret their job as involving low control, high responsibility, high demand who get into trouble. Second on the list of bad work scenarios would be ones where you have the combination now of low demand, low control. Because now you've got the double whammy of lack of control in your life plus boredom. And what's the best possible way of framing all of this? And these are the folks with high demand and high control. And this is typically upper management. This is the folks running things. And as long as this is them doing some sort of job that they like, and it's usually some sort of job that they're obsessively attached to, the high degree of control and the high degree of demand is a great combination. Now, this came through subtly in a fascinating study that was done some years ago. And it was, had a very atypical pair of authors. One of the giants of behavioral endocrinology was a man named Seymour Levine at Stanford University. Everyone knew him as Gig. And Gig Levine published a paper with his son. His son, who was not a scientist. His son, who was a professional musician, who played in, I believe, the Minneapolis Symphony. And they did the following study. They looked at patterns of stress, subjective senses of stress, health, all of that, in two groups of musicians. Those playing professionally in symphony orchestras, those playing professionally in small ensembles, string quartets, things of that sort. They did all the same controls on their lab rat musicians that they should have done. They matched the two groups for the total amount of time they travel, for income, all of that. The sole difference was these guys were playing in a symphony and these guys were playing chamber music. And what they saw was the chamber music folks were far less stressed. What's this about? One of the things that's constantly emphasized when people think about successful aging is the remarkable longevity of symphony conductors, and they're all conducting into their 90s, and they've got the perfect job, which we will get to in a few lectures. They've got the aerobic exercises we've heard, but they also have control. They're the head of the orchestra, and what that often translates into is a miserable lack of control on the part of the instrumentalists in there because the conductor controls everything. It was, in fact, not until that many years ago that unions of orchestral musicians got the right to demand bathroom breaks with some regularity. Look at this. You're an adult playing there, and the conductor is the one who decides when the oboe people can go to the potty. Marked lack of control versus chamber musicians far more control as to what's going on in their lives. This is also thought to be a factor, this combination of high demand, high control of people who thrive in one of the all-time stressful occupations, people who are air traffic controllers. And a researcher named Robert Rose spent much of his career looking at the physiology of the stress response in air traffic controllers and trying to figure out how that maps on to job performance. And apparently there's essentially a bimodal 
shift. Two separate profiles of air traffic controllers. There's the ones who come in and after a remarkably short number of months are sopping stressed messes and can't continue the job. And then the ones who just go on for decades and are great at it. What's the difference? And what he saw was a very different style of how they did the work. A very different way of doing it. You had the folks who lasted almost no time at all, and what you would see is the morning they were going to work to do the, whatever shift it was, they already had an elevated stress response blasting through the roof. They get into their job, stress response is still way up there. They finish the job, and hours later, they're still recovering from the stress response. We should know by now that's not a harbinger of a good outcome. And then you look at the folks who did wonderfully, who lasted forever, and what you would see is up to three seconds before they would sit down in the chair and start working, no stress response, everything fine, start the stressful work, blast it through the roof, and the second it's over with, they're off thinking about dinner. What they're doing is having a stress response only when it was needed. What these people are about was having an enormously highly demanding job, but what they tended to also see psychologically was they viewed themselves as having a lot of control, and that took away the psychological stress of the anticipation they're recovering from. So that's this key variable of control. On to the next variable, and this is a rather subtle one, a perception as to whether things are getting worse or getting better. Let me give you an example of this in the experimental realm. Two rats. First day, one of them gets 50 shocks. The next day, it gets 25. In other words, a total of 75 shocks. Meanwhile, over here is the rat who's getting 10 shocks the first day and 25 the next total of 35 shocks, 75 versus 35. Who's more stressed? It's absolutely obvious the guy's gotten a total of 75, far more shocks than this guy. No, that's not what you see. Who has worse stress response? The guy going from 10 to 25. The one going from 50 to 25 is sitting there saying, 25 piece of cake, this is fabulous. Things are getting better. So what you see is this very important variable. It's not just how much of a stressor there is, but it's which direction are you coming to in order to get to that stressor. Now, you can show this also in a very subtle study that I did with my baboons some years ago. Okay, you've got dominance hierarchies. You've got number one and number 10 and number 20. And the quality of life is very different depending on your dominance rank. And high-ranking guys very aggressively enforce their high rank. Except every now and then, the ranks change. In other words, every now and then, the relationship between two baboons with their known ranking difference becomes unstable and maybe even changes. So what does stability look like? You see the interactions between this pair of baboons, number five and number six, and number five is winning 95% of the interactions with number six. That's stable. In contrast, number five and number six, number five is winning 51% of the interactions with number six. What's that about? That's an unstable dyad. They might very well be just about to flip. And thus, what we begin to see is an issue of control, predictability, stability, nice, stable relationships are much more predictable. Suddenly, you would come up with this prediction that, well, instability in and of itself is a stressor. So you look at these interactions amongst these male baboons, and you keep track of how stable, how unstable the dyadic relationships are between these baboons with a very simple prediction. The more instability, the closer you are to that 51% versus 49, the more instability, the more stressful, the higher the glucorticoid levels. That's not what you see. For example, you look at number five, and if he's having a lot of unstable interactions with number six, number five has a huge stress response. You look at number five, and you look at how many unstable interactions he's having with number four, and he's got no stress response. 
how could this be? Unpredictability, the same number of fights, a critical difference. If you're number five and you're having a lot of stressful interactions with number six, that means number six is breathing down your neck and is about to toss you out and you're about to get a demotion. If you're having a lot of unstable interactions with number four, it means you're about to supplant him. You're about to get a promotion. Number five, instability in this direction, bad news. In that direction, great news. It's not just, in this case, the amount of instability. It's what it means. And when it means good news, you don't get as much of a stress response. So you see similar things in humans, and you can even see it under remarkable circumstances where you get interactions between the absolute reality of a stressor and how you actually interpret it. Okay, here's a possibility in a corporation. You've got this huge corporation, and there's some guy working in the mailroom getting you know, $7 an hour or some such thing, and then you've got the CEO of the company who's getting a gazillion dollars a year. People suddenly discover that this guy in the mailroom is the greatest mailroom person on the entire planet, the most skillful one, and management comes in and says, we need to reward this. Starting tomorrow, you have $100,000 a year salary. Meanwhile, you notice that the CEO has just done some disastrously imprudent things and practically bankrupted the company. And in a shocking, shocking exception to the usual rule, the guy's actually held responsible for this. And they say, okay, because you have screwed up royally starting tomorrow, you have $100,000 a year salary. You can bet the mailroom guy is not going to be going for a headhunter to find another job. And you could bet the next day the CEO is $100,000 a year means very different things depending on which direction you're coming from. Now, where this can wind up being sort of relevant is when you see these interactions between control, predictability, outcome, interpretation, where you can even see interactions between some of these pieces, where it could be fascinating, not just in the realm of how much of a stress response you have to bad, stressful things, but remarkably what the response is in your body to great news, to wonderful things. And this is the world of somebody from out of nowhere wins the lottery and it's great and it's transformed their life. And it winds up being unsettling for a number of reasons. One is it totally messes up their relationships with everybody else. And the other is the sense of the randomness is very often reported by these folks as being quite unsettling. Or you can have somebody who wins the lottery in a much deeper, more important way. This is someone who is desperately in need of an organ transplant and is on the waiting list and who knows and who knows. And the clock is ticking for how much longer they can survive. And suddenly from out of nowhere, it happens. The transplant, the organ becomes available. This is wondrous. Suddenly it's there and their life is saved. And in the aftermath, amid the gratitude, the pleasure, the joy, what is also very often seen amongst these transplant individuals is a tremendous agitated sense of stress built around the lack of control. My God, if that person on the motorcycle had taken that curve five miles an hour slower wouldn't have died, I'd be sitting here dying for lack of that organ. My God, if one of the other people on the donor list had a slightly better genetic match with that organ, wouldn't have been me. The sense of, I'm going to live, but I had so little control over what happened that that winds up being quite unsettling. So a world of stress and a world of psychological modulators of stress where it even plays into things that are not stressful, things that could be good news, fun news, wondrously life-saving news. So what have we gotten to at this point? We've now gone through some important modulators of the stress response from the last lecture and this one, outlets for frustration, social support, predictive information, a sense of control, interpreting things as getting better. All of those are great. And thus you need a punchline for how to live your life successfully with these factors in mind and from what you've learned here. And if you think what you've learned is as follows, 
it would be a disaster. If you think the rule is get as much control in your life as possible, get as much predictive information as possible, have as many outlets as possible, if you turn this into this mantra of more and more and more control and more predictability, that's not going to reduce your levels of stress. That's going to increase it in lots of ways. Because it turns out these principles don't apply all the time. They apply only with certain parameters. Only some of the time does a sense of control, this predictive information, actually help. First one, predictive information. We've already gone through that scenario, which is the lab rat is getting the shocks now and then, and 10 seconds before each shock, it gets the little warning light. Great, and it's quite protective. That's wonderful. When does it not work? Now you've got the same rat, and instead of getting the warning light 10 seconds before each shock, it gets the warning light half a second before. That does no good whatsoever. How come? Because the rat doesn't have enough time to activate its coping strategy. On the other hand, suppose that you've got the warning light coming instead of 10 seconds in advance. It's coming three and a half weeks in advance. It does no good at all either, for obvious reasons. What you wind up seeing is predictive information helps only within a certain time span. When it's not too far in advance, when there's enough time to plan your coping strategy and have it far enough of advance when it's a really major stressor, and not only doesn't it protect, it makes things worse. Just imagine if you have this omnipotent voice that suddenly comes in and gives you some predictive information, saying three years, 27 days, and four hours from now, you're going to have a horrible accident and your leg is going to be amputated. Oh, I feel great We're having gotten all this predictive information. If it's far enough in advance, not only doesn't it protect, it can make things worse. Next realm where it may not work very well. Next realm, and again, this has to do with predictive information, and the point is, what is it predicting? What is the nature of the predictive stressor that is now being considered by you? Here's two scenarios. Here's the first one, this very odd one, where this voice, again, this omnipotent voice, comes in and suddenly says, oh my god, I just heard that yesterday there was this disaster, this meteor hit Earth, and in the process hit your backyard and took out all your flamingos. But you know what? I've got some predictive information for you. It's never going to happen again. Oh, that's wonderful. At least I know now in the aftermath of that disaster, I don't have to worry. Predictive information there doesn't do you any good whatsoever because it's predictive information about a stressor that is such a low probability that the predictive information doesn't help. You're not worrying about it happening anyway. Or you can have the converse. You can now have the omnipotent voice in some other sort of scenario. And now what it is is the voice comes in and says, remember driving into work today how awful the traffic was? I've got predictive information. It's going to be awful tomorrow also. Whoa, all that predictive information, I feel wonderful now. That doesn't help in the slightest because that is such a common stressor that you already take it for granted. So predictive information helps only for stressors with a moderate likelihood of occurring. If it is such a rare stressor that you don't even worry about it, it doesn't help. If it's such a common stressor that you take it for granted, it doesn't help. And you can even have predictive information where it does no good whatsoever when it's even giving you predictive news about something good. Okay, omnipotent voice again saying, you know how you drove to work today and there was horrible traffic? Well, three months and four days from now when you drive to work, there's going to be no traffic whatsoever. The police are going to pull you over and insist you share their donuts with them. Oh, that's wonderful. This does not count as useful predictive information, even in the face of it carrying good news. So predictability helps only some of the time, and very importantly, what we saw was if it's far enough in advance of the stressor, it could actually make things worse. How about control? How about a sense of control? The easy solution from the control section is have as much of a sense of control as often as possible and just magnify it and control, 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 and I'm the master of my fate and you need to think that way all the time. Absolutely not. 
A sense of control can be a disaster at times. Some of the most compassionate things we ever do is to try to decrease somebody's sense of control. Nobody could have stopped the car in time the way that little girl darted out. It doesn't matter if you had gotten dad to the doctor sooner. It was an incurable disease. There's nothing you could have done about it. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. You didn't have any control. And some of the worst things that we ever do societally is magnify somebody's sense of control. Oh, what does she expect if she's going to dress like that walking around a bar, bad part of town? Oh, what do you expect if they refuse to assimilate into society? Of course people are going to turn against them. One of the worst versions of that in medical history concerns schizophrenia. And schizophrenia, a horrible disease, has had an awful major impact for decades and decades on mental health. And of course people have wondered, what causes schizophrenia? And up to the 1950s or so, there was an absolutely clear answer given in the field, which is schizophrenia is caused by the mother. It's a certain mothering style named schizophrenogenic mothering style, and it's the mother's fault. In other words, the mother had the control to determine whether or not the child became schizophrenic. You know, as the years went by, it was viewed as this was a little harsh and a more compassionate version of this theory came in, which was they allowed the possibility that it was the father who screwed up parents' parenting style as the cause of schizophrenia. And then in the 1950s, there was a revolution. People discovered some of the first drugs, the antipsychotics, that could control schizophrenia. And this shockwave went through the psychiatric community Oh my God, it's got nothing to do with parenting style. It's a biochemical disorder. And schizophrenogenic mothering went down the tube overnight, and you could see amazing editorials in some of those journals, the pain some of these healthcare professionals felt when realizing what they had done by inflating a sense of control. They would write editorials like, I've spent my entire life battling this nightmare of a disease. I have tried to do good. I have tried to help. I've done the best I could do with the information available as to what causes this disease, this mothering style idea. My God, the damage I have done over the years. We see this pattern here. You can, in some cases, be wildly compassionate, wildly stress-reducing by decreasing somebody's sense of control. And some of the most awful, stressful things you can ever do to someone could be increasing their sense. How do you get some rules coming out of this? And basically what you see is as follows. In the face of stressors that are mild to moderate in severity, you want to increase somebody's feeling of control, whether it's realistic or not. You want them to feel like they were in control because what you're biasing the person to do then, to feel, is to think just how bad it would have been if I hadn't had a sense of control. It feels great. It builds up a sense of efficacy. When do you not want to inflate the sense of control in the face of horrible, disastrous stressors? Because all you're doing is setting somebody up with a sense of control to think, oh my God, I could have made it so much better and I didn't. Sense of control works for only mild to moderate stressors. And you can see